And our next uh, next capstone presentation is by Will Carden, and the title of his paper is Warsaw on Thames, Polish Labor Migration to Great Britain. Thank you, Professor Stent. So on January 5th of this year, the British Prime Minister David Cameron appeared on BBC's Andrew Marr Show, where he was interviewed about a series of hot-button issues ranging from Scottish independence to taxation. However, as transitional controls and the free movement of Romanians and Bulgarians had been abolished four days prior, the fear of an influx of immigrants from these countries brought labor migration to the forefront of this interview. In an effort to reduce the attractiveness of the UK as an immigration destination, the British government sought to limit immigrants' access to social benefits. And in attempting to illustrate the various ways in which labor migrants take advantage of the British welfare system, um, the Prime Minister proclaimed it to be wrong for someone from Poland working in the UK to come and receive child benefits for his or her family working back home, or living back home, rather. As these remarks obviously um, deeply offended many policymakers in Warsaw, they incited a swift diplomatic backlash. Polish Foreign Minister Radek Sikorski, who has become very well known for digital diplomacy in recent years, um, reported first um, via Twitter asking, if Britain gets our taxpayers, shouldn't it also pay their benefits? And why should Polish taxpayers subsidize British taxpayers as children? Shortly thereafter, um, Prime Minister Tusk <laughs> entered the fray echoing these sentiments, calling Cameron's statement unwarranted and unacceptable as nobody has the right to single out Poles as a particular group that abuses or exploits something. So as evidenced by the spirited nature of such dialogue, labor migration remains a point of contention in modern European political debate. And although both Great Britain and Poland, as member of the, members of the EU, ostensibly have committed themselves to this um, free movement of people, in practice, immigration engenders tensions between the two nations, especially when considering the implications of it for each. So in my capstone, I delve into the ramifications of labor migration for Poland in the post-EU accession era, um, paying particular attention to the way in which this phenomenon is portrayed by Polish media. In conducting my research, I translated and analyzed approximately um, 60 articles from two of Poland's most respected newspapers, Gazeta Wyborcza and Rzeczpospolita, and then this pool of sources was subsequently narrowed down um, to include nearly 30 based on pertinence and the degree to which these articles or publications demonstrated the nature of immigration dialogue. From these news outlets, my paper is able to elucidate the complexities of, of public discourse over labor migration, exploring the media's presentation of cases demonstrating the merits and the drawbacks of immigration for both Poles at home and abroad. So in doing so, the essay examines the characteristics and socioeconomic impact of post-accession labor migration, how public concern over these effects um, evolved into a form of mass hysteria immediately following EU accession, how Poland and its diaspora community interact with one another, and then finally, it introduces the global financial crisis of 2008 and its impact on labor migration, both in its scale and popularity. So taking all of this into account, I then attempt to speculate as to the future of labor migration as a trend in Polish society and shed light on immigration's effect on Polish identity, actually, within the broader framework of deepening EU integration. So due to time constraints, unfortunately, I won't be able to provide you with a comprehensive overview of Polish um, labor migration. However, for the purpose of my presentation, it's sufficient to say that immigration immediately following the fall of communism um, was characterized and came as a result of economic necessity and occurred largely in an illegal manner. Um, after Poland's first semi-free election in 1989, the government embarked upon a path of extrication from communism, which consisted of a two-pronged um, effort to bring about democracy while ushering in a free market economy. So in pursuit of the latter, Finance Minister Leszek Balcarowicz implemented measures of shock therapy, which, as the name suggests, um, very severely affected the vast majority of Polish society. And as many Poles began to believe that their economic futures in Poland were unstable, they contemplated immigration as a means by which they would be able to improve their mat material situation. So for the Poles who did choose to immigrate, Great Britain represented an ideal situation due both to its economic strength and its relatively lax system of internal immigration controls. Um, by posing as tourists at the initial point of entry, many Poles received a six-month visa, which was long enough for them to legitimize their stay, to connect to informal immigrant networks, and also to find work, most importantly. And although their status as illegals forced them to remain invisible um, to the eyes of the British government, the nature of immigration controls in the UK was such that after the initial point of entry, the risk of exposure was very minimal. So when Poland joined the European Union on May 1, 2004, the situation of Polish migrants to the UK changed dramatically. Great Britain opened its labor market to all Polish citizens, effectively legalizing their ability to reside and work in the UK. 
and the elimination of illegal barriers to migration precipitated a market increase um, in the number of immigrants arriving. And although official statistics are still up for debate, experts estimated that by the end of 2006, around 1.95 million Polish immigrants had immigrated, 580,000 of whom were in Great Britain. So controversy um, extends to the discussion of its socioeconomic impact on Poland in particular. On one hand, leading economists applauded immigrants for their con contributions to the Poland's economy. Um, these economists said that these immigrants were alleviating some of the strain on Poland's national budget and social security system, because Poles, as residents of the UK, were filing for social benefits there, which reduced their dependence on Polish, the Polish government for such services. Additionally, the outflow of workers reduced unemployment by up to 3% between EU accession in 2004 and the end of 2006. Um, and as Poles vacated positions on the domestic labor market, it created additional job opportunities for those seeking employment. And this resulted in the employment of about half a million persons by the end of um, 2006. Finally, as Poles working in the UK were sending money back to Poland in the form of remittances, labor migration effectively increased domestic consumer demand. Um, and in 2005, the National Bank of Poland released statistics calculating the value of these remittances to be around 22 billion PLN, as opposed to the pre-accession 2003 figure of 17.9. However, in spite of such promising economic benefits, um, leading demographers and scholars such as Marek Okulski of the University of Warsaw believe that immigration was an enormous loss for Poland. Um, Polish labor migrants represented some of the best educated citizens who, on the whole, were finding jobs in Great Britain that were below their level of qualification, and generally after their arrival, they were expressing little interest in returning to Poland. So in 2005, Rzecz Pospolita reported um, that employment agencies such as Work Service and Horizon Management were searching in Poland for candidates for occupations such as drivers, electricians, assembly line workers, shopkeepers, mechanics, painters, and even cooks. And although these professions didn't require the full set of skills that one would have after graduating university, um, university graduates were still attracted to such offers as um, higher salaries in the UK afforded them a higher standard of living. In other words, although Poles were performing these roles, they weren't necessarily deriving satisfaction from the job themselves. The money that they received was enough to um, pursue private passions in their personal lives outside of work. So in turn, higher um, earnings are creating a heightened sense of financial stability and prompting Poles to put down roots, buy apartments, um, raise families in Great Britain, and then after taking such steps to assimilate into British society, many scholars note that Poles did not consider a return home to Poland, which is very disconcerting to them. So as Poles, both at home and abroad, became more cognizant of this trend towards longer-term migration, debate intensified as public discourse in the matter became very frenzied. Um, polls such as Gazeta Wyborcza's online reader, Axon One, it's his internet pseudonym, lamented the fact that immigration was robbing Poland of its patriots and that politicians have had nothing or done nothing to counteract this phenomenon. Um, he writes that he horribly regretted that politicians and that this, this regret from time to time even transformed into hate for the fact that they have killed his dreams, his faith, and his Poland. So emotions such as these expressed by Axon One manifested themselves most notably in the media's coverage of an episode of a mass immigration of medical professionals and other workers who were deemed to be integral to the welfare of society. So in an effort to qualify for work in the UK, many Polish doctors were acquiring certificates of qualification from the regional chambers of phys physicians and also enrolling in English language courses to be more attractive on the British labor market. Both Gazeta Wyborcza and Rzecz Pospolita frantically reported on the departure of these doctors as their absence was interpreted to be harmful to society insofar as Polish patients would now have li um, limited access to treatment options. So in an effort to shed more light on medical professionals' motiv motivations for immigration, Gazeta Wyborcza interviewed a cardiologist and a dentist who had immigrated shortly after EU accession. And above all else, these two interviewees cited higher earnings as chief among the factors influencing their decision to immigrate. On average, these specialists made between 2,000 and 4,000 pounds per month which was a salary that they said would be virtually unattainable back home in Poland. So needless to say, such a study did, didn't really do a lot to assuage public fears about labor migration. However, regardless of one's reason for migration, Polish immigrants were arriving to the UK in droves, um, rapidly enlarging the diaspora community there. And although many did seek to integrate into British society, they simultaneously wanted to maintain a sense of Polish identity. So for these Poles, such an identity meant a connection to the homeland, primarily through um, access to Polish food exports and Polish language media. And in, in uh, Polish gro grocery stores in particular, 
reported an exponential increase in sales after EU accession. And in the case of Polish Specialties, which is a London-based wholesaler of Polish foodstuffs, profits were growing at the rate of 100% annually. And this even resulted in the conclusion of a cooperative deal with British cor corporation Cash and Carry in 2006, um, allowing Polish specialties to sell exports as, such as pierogi, kielbasa, and ready-to-eat meals um, all across the UK. In the media realm, um, literature and television programming um, reflecting the experiences of Polish immigrants became very, very popular as well. So for example, Justyna Tomańska, um, a famous Polish author, she authored an autobiographical book called Polk of Londynie, which narrates the trials and tribulations of immigrating from small town Poland, Ozimek, to um, the UK. Furthermore, um, Telewizja Nova and Rzeczpospolita co-produced what was a television series and also a series of articles in the newspaper entitled Battle of Britain, which followed a handful of Poles as they grappled with the challenges of finding employment and establishing themselves on the British Isles. As a viewership of approximately one million attests, this was very popular and definitely had an appeal. Um, Poles also maintained a connection to the fatherland in, insofar as they constituted an important political voting bloc for policymakers in Warsaw. So in 2007, a marshal of the same, Marek Jurek, met with the leadership of British Polonia, who articulated the community's concerns ranging from double taxation both in Poland and, and in the UK for the years 2005 and 2006, to increased funding for Polish cultural institutes. Additionally, Polish NGOs, such as Civil Rights Protection, added to the list of requests a desire for government protection against exploitation in the workplace. So according to this organization's media spokesperson, um, Civil Rights Protection proposed that Poland expand its consular services um, by assigning a labor attaché who would be tasked with um, scrutinizing and observing working conditions and reporting it back to Warsaw. Additionally, this NGO lobbied for the creation of an integrated system of information which would outline the British labor rec regulations um, as well as where and how to find work. And in their view, such measures would limit exploitation. So when the global financial crisis hit in 2008, it affected both Poles living in the UK and back home in Poland. According to the British Home Office, in 2009, the number of immigrants arriving from new EU member states, or the 2004 um, Big Bang enlargement, had dropped by 33%. Um, and in this year, only 106,000 immigrants were registered in the worker registration scheme, and roughly half of those were Poles. So the economic downturn definitely affected that, as well as the wages of, of Poles in the UK. According to the Migration Policy Institute of Washington, around 89% of Poles employed in the UK at this time made less than 400 pounds a week before taxes. So if you recalculate this, according to the exchange rate at the time, it amounted to around 6,500 PLN per month. Um, and for Poles working in lower positions, um, such as food service, this sank as low as 4,300 PLN per month, which actually was only 700 PLN than the average Polish worker working back home in a place like Warsaw. So as the profitability of immigra immigration decreased, um, Polish media attention turned to the prospect of the return of Poles living in Great Britain. And in the case of small towns like Kłodzko, um, campaigns were lost, or launched in an effort to convince Poles to repatriate themselves voluntarily. So the mayor of this town actually compiled a database um, with all the personal information of approximately 500 citizens who had immigrated to the UK. Um, and then he dispatched ambassadors to uh, large centers of these immigrants like London, Birmingham, and Glasgow to spread information by word of mouth about employment opportunities at a, a new mall that was being constructed back on the quotes to try to attract them back. And although the success of such, initiative, such, uh, such initiatives remains unknown, um, in 2009 Polish media did note a temporary reversal in the trend of immigration. So for the first time since Poland's accession to the EU, more Poles were returning to Poland than immigrating to the UK. As the pound had decreased in value from around 7 PLN to 4.6 by the end of 2009, immigration no longer represented as lucrative a venture and consequently was not as attractive. Additionally, as some Poles were losing their jobs in the West, they had no choice but to return to Poland to weather the economic storm. However, unfortunately, after arriving back in Poland, many found that the domestic labor market conditions were even bleaker than when they had left. Um, in an environment where employers were receiving over 30 applications for each job opening, the return of Polish immigrants abroad was spiking unemployment. In the case of Poles who did stay in the U UK, the effects of the financial crisis became evident most notably in the declining uh, growth in the value of remittances. So on one hand, as I said, Poles who were laid off or fired as a result of the economic downturn simply didn't have money to send back to their families in Poland. But also on the other hand, some experts believe that the financial crisis changed um, a lot of immigrants' expectations for the future. 
So as both Poland and the UK were both in recession, Poles in the UK who had assimilated into British society, purchased homes, sent their children to schools, um, didn't wish to give up their lifestyle in Britain to return to Poland who was also suffering. Um, so thus, as they viewed residency as being more long term and no longer felt inclined to send money back home. However, in more recent years, as the economy has begun to rebound, the popularity of labor migration has increased, um, representing an enduring phenomenon in post-communist Polish society. And this has restored the attractiveness of, of immigration from a financial standpoint, as the discrepancy in salary levels between those in Poland and the UK is once again widening. As mentioned previously, higher salaries in Britain allowed Poles the financial capital um, to afford a higher standard of living and also to pursue private passions outside of work. And in addition, the Polish media confirmed that immigrants were gaining a sense of satisfaction um, from familiarizing themselves with foreign cultures, developing practical knowledge, and even um, improving their English language skills. And Polish membership in the EU continues to represent a type of mobility that permits immigrants to make for themselves a career while achieving a higher social status. So as the economy improves and continues to improve, it's expected that labor migration will remain a popular avenue for both professional and personal advancement. So, as Poles continue to immigrate to destinations like Great Britain, I believe there will be an intensifying debate over what it means to be Polish in the post-accession era. And as I've discussed at length, Poles were departing Poland in search of economic benefits and the belief that life in the UK would provide them with a greater sense of fulfillment. So as their desire for prosperity requires them to abandon Poland itself, I believe um, Polish identity will undergo a considerable degree of change. So against the backdrop of increased mobility as afforded by EU integration, I ask the question at the end of my analysis, will Polishness be based on one's allegiance to the territory? Or alternatively, will Polish identity be more so rooted in a common set of values um, and a cultural consensus? And if the latter is to be the case, what then will distinguish um, Polish identity from a more pan-European identity? Of course, the answers to such complex questions um, are impossible to give, as Polish identity is fluid and will only transform with time. However, based on my analysis of the impact of labor migration on Polish society already, I do believe this phenomenon um, is bound to have lasting effects as we move forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let me just throw out the first question. Um, to what extent are Polish migrants now who are permanently living in England represented in the political system? At the local level there, I don't know if there's anyone, MP in Westminster who's mm -hmm. the Polish background. How are they, what are they doing in terms of having an impact on the political system there? From what I can tell from, from my sources is the fact that there seems to be a, a, a division there. Mm -hmm. A lot of Poles are very interested in making these homeland organizations and kind of self-segregating into neighborhoods in London and other metropolitan centers and kind of keeping to themselves. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, I've seen um, you know, a, lot of, a lot of Poles saying, you know, we're here to stay, like I was saying, it's a longer term migration and wanting to take efforts to um, get involved in British politics. But from what I've seen so far, it seems to be limited in that respect. <laughs> but I presume if they're going to live in these sort of self-created ghettos, and they, and they will have some kind of representation, at least at the local level, mm -hmm. right? Exactly. I guess that takes time. OK. Questions, comments? <laughs> uh, similar vein, but how does the diaspora community, do they, are they politically active back in Poland? In the sense, kind of like maybe perhaps you know, Armenian or uh, Ukrainian communities are trying to influence change back in their home countries, although they are citizens or have decided to permanently stay abroad? I think they definitely are. Like I said, you know, the Marshal of the same Mark York visited in 2007 to hear out their, their concerns. Mm -hmm. I think he's definitely concerned about their votes. Um, but additionally, I think there seems to be some tension actually between the diaspora community because like I said, there's this resentment for them moving abroad. It's like a brain drain, Poland's best and brightest. And so when he actually visited in 2007, he um, you know, heard out their concerns but also was trying to say things like, you need to come back to Poland and that mm -hmm. sort of thing. And so I, I do know that there's still, you know, a community that's valued and very important in Polish politics. Um, but like I said, there's a tension there. Professor Smith. Yes, I have this really interesting source base with the newspapers. Did you find that there was a lot of distinction between their coverage? Was it more that they're distinct media entities, or were they just seemingly interested in different trends? I actually kind of saw that in a lot of newspapers, because I focused the sources that I incorporated in the paper on just Gazeta Wyborcza and just Pospolica, but I was also looking at other newspapers and even some online blogs, and it kind of seemed like all of them would kind of focus their attention on one issue at a time. And what most interested me actually about the way they reported is one month they would be hailing the benefits of how, you know, Poles are respected abroad as being industrious workers and we have such an awesome international reputation. 
But then on the other hand, like the very next month or even week, they would talk about how this is so terrible for Poland and it's going to be a huge demographic crisis moving forward. So it's, when you say hysteria, I mean they're kind of like leaping on top of it. Exactly. Like blowing up about it and then, yeah, interesting. Good. Kind of <clears throat> going off, off, off what you just said a bit, um, these newspapers tended to speak about labor migration as being well received by British society and it was skilled, they're, they're doing awesome like you said. I'm wondering uh, if you could speak, and I know this is out of the scope of your paper, but uh, could you speak about maybe the tensions existing in British society between, you know, more, oh, sorry, um, uh, kind of South Asian, Asian Muslim immigrant communities in London or wider Great Britain and Polish immigrants and how maybe tensions arise between you know, which, is the, which is the better immigrant or who is assimilating better or something. Okay. Um, I, I don't actually know much about, like, for instance, the interactions between like Polish immigrants or immigrants from like Pakistan or India. Mm -hmm. But I do. I did come across in my study, you know, how Poles perceive themselves in the grand scheme of things and in the hierarchy. And a lot of them considered there to be a very large, um, large instances of xenophobia and anti-Polish sentiment. And they actually did a couple surveys. A couple of these newspapers did um, are about this. And people were responding saying things like, you know, they believe anti-Polish sentiment to be a, a more serious problem than like anti-Semitism or you know, anti-American sentiment or like Russophobia in the world. And they felt like personally attacked by that. And I think a lot, a lot of this comes from the fact that, you know, Poles are in these very visible industries like food service or tourism. Um, and so, you know, when things like the financial crisis occur and there's a lot of economic problems, people look for a scapegoat. And I think, you know, you see the, the Polish waiter and it's easy to blame and like, you know, blame that person. But I do, I do know, I'm, I'm not sure how valid some of those claims are. Um, but it definitely manifested itself in some of the sources that I that I came across. Is there a regional <coughs> variation um, in terms of which regions are sending uh, people to Britain um, the most, and uh, what explains that variation? There's From what I've come across, um, the regions that are most economically depressed in Poland are sending more than, for instance, like Warsaw. So I, I no noticed there was a couple studies from the southeast of Poland. Um, we're close to the Ukrainian border and a lot of economic depression there. Um, and so they were sending people, mainly seasonal workers. Um, and then also this was kind of outside of the scope of my paper since I focused on the UK, but also in Schlonsk or like uh, Silesia, um, close to the German border, a lot of Poles actually would live on the weekends in, in Poland, but then work five days a week in Germany. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I'm fascinated by this mayor, the proactive mayor who collected the 500 people database. <laughs> Uh, what kind of reaction was there to that kind of attempt to bring people back? Um, was it positive? I'm thinking locally. In terms of the Polish scene, um, it sets up some implications of, you know, did anybody consider this to be intrusion? Um, or was this greeted very positively? What is the uh, value milieu for this sort of thing in Poland? So that's actually an interesting case because in order to get all the personal information, he, this mayor actually sat down with the families of immigrants. Um, so presumably it was positively received or else they wouldn't have offered right, the information. Right, they were volunteering this And I think a lot of it was coming as a reaction or more so as, as a fear of immigrants coming from places like the Ukraine to take jobs. And so they'd rather have you know, their compatriots come back from Great Britain and take you know, work in the shopping mall uh -huh. as opposed to people from Eastern Europe. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, are these groups drawn to other immigrant communities, or and do they prefer any? Um, do they maybe go with like Czech or Romanian or whatever Eastern European communities, or do they commiserate with just general immigrant communities? Well, the if Russian you, immigrants. Or, yeah. <laughs> as far as I know, I think they they pretty much keep to themselves. Mm -hmm. um, one thing I did come across is that there's not really a, a lot of need. Like for instance, you know, in earlier waves of immigration, like in the 19th century, coming to the U.S. and you're saying goodbye to your family forever and you kind of commiserate with other immigrants is all being in the same boat. But I think for a lot of Poles, since you know you can hop on a Ryanair flight from Warsaw to, to you know London and back and forth, um, there's not much of a need to do that, and so they kind of you know maintain ties back I home. I guess also, also I, mean, I mean like more politically, politically, when they fight for immigrant rights, for example, do they combine their efforts with other groups that are perhaps represented of other migrant communities? That's actually something I didn't really run into a lot of information on. But. Definitely interesting to do some more research. Can I say something else? So I'm assuming the number one destination for Polish 
immigrants within the EU is Britain. Is Germany the second? Yes. It is. Yeah, and then what comes after that? I know Germany and Sweden are very, very popular. Yeah. Um, in particular, Germany. Um, there's a lot of contingent about like how statistics are compiled because yeah. it, what constitutes a labor immigrant if you have a house in Silesia but you're also working in, yeah. in Germany. You're right. <laughs> so it's difficult to kind of you know quantify all of that. But I, I do know that I saw in some of my sources that Sweden was very popular, and also Ireland, um, but Sweden in particular due to the social benefits. Yeah. <clears throat> um, single uh, Poles who emigrate to the UK, um, how, and if they want to start a family, do they go back home to find somebody, or do they try and find somebody in the Polish community there? And how much, is there any intermarriage between, um, uh, basically how is that, that sort of discussed or coverage? That's actually something I haven't really come across a lot of information on. Um, so I'm sorry, I can't come on that. Apologize. And it's not written about in the, in the newspapers, which is also um, I guess one other question. Um, did you come across in your research, does the Catholic Church take a stand on these things? This was actually very interesting. Um, in 2009, Pope Benedict came to Poland and made an appeal to Polish clergymen to go to the British Isles um, and you know, serve their compatriots. So I found out from this that, that for approximately 10 years, there, since 1999, there had been a Polish like church structure operating both in Ireland and in the UK. Um, and so several dozen actually immigrated after that. And I think there's around 80 to 90 ministry centers um, staffed by Polish people. So. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much.